Well, good morning. Good morning, everyone. And uh, welcome to the third workshop of this series, Statistics Can Be Fun, with Dr. Megan Lee coming to us from Bonn University. Uh, just a reminder that our fourth and final part in this series on SPS uh, is next Wednesday, the 26th at the same time at 10.30. Uh, as you may already know, we are recording and uploading these uh, workshops to the SCPA YouTube channel, and I'll post the little link there. Uh, and um, subscribe to our uh, YouTube channel, and then you'll receive notifications of new uploads. And become a member of the SCPA. It's free, and the form only takes a couple of minutes. While we're here, I just want to mention also that Megan will be delivering a workshop on Qualtrics on the 4th of May. So keep an eye out for that. Um, yeah, that's all from me. Uh, over to you, Megan. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alison. Hello, everybody who has already uh, done the first two statistics uh, workshops with me. But don't fear, if this is your first time, that is completely fine. Um, we did cover in the first workshop on data cleaning, how to get your data into SPSS, how to clean it in SPSS. There's a couple of tips and tricks in there of how to best utilize SPSS and how to do some um, easy um, transformations and things on your data. The second week, which was last week, we looked at descriptive statistics. So um, what we did with our all of our demographic data, and we looked at um, all the descriptors for our categorical demographics, like gender and geographical location, and we looked at descriptive statistics for our continuous data of like age and BMI, um, and just describing what our participants looked like in our data set. Um, we also looked at correlations, which is uh, the little baby brother of regression and uh, looking at relationships between two variables. And then we looked at uh, t-tests or differences between uh, groups when there's two groups. And today we'll be expanding on those. But you don't worry, you don't have to have watched those to understand what is going on today. I will um, give you a little bit of background on some of the results that we got last week. If you would like to follow me on my socials, here are my links. This is my website. Um, it's got all my contact details on it. It also has all of my uh, research papers in nutritional psychiatry, which is uh, what I do for fun. Um, and any conferences I've been to, my posters are on there. My conversation articles, which are basically describe my PhD in very simple and easy to understand language. Um, and all of my statistic workshops that I do for the SCPA are all on there recorded as well. So today we are getting into a little bit more trickier advanced areas of uh, statistics and SPSS. So we're going to be looking at um, predicting relationships um, and group differences when there's more than two groups. So that will involve uh, different types of regression and I'll step you through the different types that there are and what they would be used for. And also ANOVA, which is an anal analysis of variance. When we have more than two groups, we can look at the differences between the averages of each group. So I'm going to ask everybody if you can pop into the chat. So I'll open the chat box up and I will keep it over here so I can follow. In the chat box, I will get you to tell me if zero is no understanding of statistics and SPSS at all, and 10 is you know everything about statistics and SPSS, I want you to give me a rating between zero and 10 of how comfortable you are with statistics. So I know kind of what level we're pitching at today. Six to seven, that's good. That's a good level for today. Three also. Four, five, seven, three, four. Yep, great. Well, if you have any questions at all, or if I'm going too fast, or if I'm not explaining things um, thoroughly enough, please feel free to pop a, um, a question in the chat box, slow me down, ask me questions. If I'm going into too much detail about something that's way over your head, just let me know. And if you haven't watched the other two uh, workshops, they are available on YouTube 
and on the SCPA side, is that right? Yeah, perfect. Okay. Um, and they will help you to, if you haven't watched them already, they will help you to get to this point, I guess. If everything today seems a little bit too much, just go back and watch those two and you should be up to date. Right. So we are going to start off today with a little bit of a uh, theoretical framework behind each of the analyses, what they are, what they're used for. And then in the second half of the uh, workshop, we will go into how we use it in SPSS and I'll show you um, a live data set that we're using at the moment that I collected data on, which closed three weeks ago, two weeks ago. So first of all, simple linear regression. It's the easiest one after correlation. Correlations, in my opinion, are the easiest um, data analysis to do, to analyze and to report. Um, so who can tell me in the chat box, what is the word that is synonymous with correlation? Coincidence? Hopefully not. Relationship, yes. It can be coincidental though, you're right. Because there's like three reasons for a correlation, right? There's either there is a relationship, there isn't a relationship, or there's a third variable creating the relationship and making it look like the relationship, right? So Albie's right on there. That's even more advanced stuff, Albie. So relationship is the correct word. So correlations are relationships. But regressions are also relationships. Correlations are identifying relationships and, and regression is predicting the relationship of one variable from another, which is pretty exciting. So if you have a look at this, this is the big sister of correlation, simple regression. This is a very, very simple example of regression. So here on the y-axis, we have our dependent variable. Who can tell me what the dependent variable is? It is weight, but what does the dependent variable do? What does a dependent variable measure? It's affected by the IVs, yes. What's the word that's synonymous with dependent variable? What is being measured? Good, Sarah. So the outcome. So the dependent variable is always the outcome. So weight is the outcome in this example. Now, what is the independent variable? What does the independent variable do? What type of variable is it? That's better, Alice. Exactly. It's the one that you manipulate in an experimental design. However, we usually use regressions in survey data. So sometimes it's tricky, particularly in this example, to really decide which is the DV and which is the IV. And usually it's the outcome and the predictor. So the IV is the variable that you're predicting the change in the other variable. So in this example, our research question would be something around how does height change someone's weight? So. The simple linear regression here, we've got the dependent variable of weight on the y-axis, so the dv always goes here, and we've got the independent variable of height on the x-axis. Now, the regression formula here is y equals a plus bx. Now, using this formula, once we do a regression, we should be able to predict somebody's weight by how tall they are. And when we run the regression and we find out one, two, three, four, five, six, so there's seven participants in this regression. They are the stars. That's their, the first participant's weight and height. So they're around 50 inches, a bit American, and just under or around 120 pounds. Now, y equals a plus bx, if we take a, which is the intercept, which is here, 
where the regression line, which we talked about last week in the correlations, intercepts the graph here. And we take B, which is two. What that means is as body weight on average goes up in the data set across the seven participants, as it goes up by two, height will increase by two on average. And that creates the slope of this line. Now, if our regression model was the perfect fit and all of the participants had perfectly aligned, they would all fall on this line. But we know in statistics that nothing is ever perfect and our predicted values of someone's weight because of their height and what they actually weigh are the, where the stars are. And the difference between the star and the line is the error in the model, so the residual. So that is basically simple regression. When you have two variables, one independent variable, one dependent variable that are continuous and can be measured in this way, you can then use your regression model to predict someone's value on X, so height, you can predict their weight from that value. So if I am 164 centimeters tall, you could say using this regression model that I would weigh this much. Very, very cool. Any questions about simple linear regression before we move on? I know this is a tiny little bit more advanced than what we were looking at last week. Don't feel silly asking any questions, please. Can you only use continuous data? Yes, Louise, you can only use continuous data unless you do a logistic regression where you can use a dichotomous, which means split into two. But simple linear regression must always be on continuous two continuous variables. If you had a categorical variable, it would turn into like an ANOVA or a, a t-test. The two, good. Okay, so the two is B. So if we're predicting the person's weight, so we're always looking to predict the outcome, which is why we look at the, the intercept. So everybody starts here at 80. Plus for every two inches, so B equals two. So for every two inches, weight goes up by two pounds. And that's what makes this slope. Yeah. So someone who is 50, so this person here who's 50 inches tall, if they went up by 52 inches, they would then be 120 times this. So it's whatever your height is times two. So it goes up by two. Next. Yeah, the formula is always the same. The things that change are the intercept value, so where the line intercepts the graph, and how much each value goes up. So this B and this A will always be different. You're predicting Y by putting in a value of X, someone's height, and then applying that formula. But these will always be different depending on what regression you use. That's a good question. Formula is always the same. Y equals A plus BX, always the same for regression. Good. Multiple regression. So if simple linear regression is one independent variable and one dependent variable, multiple regression is one dependent variable, always continuous, and multiple independent variables. So you can have two, three, four, five, six. This is where your independent variables can become categorical. So you can use some categorical independent variables or predictors. You always, your dependent variable though is continuous in these circumstances. 
hierarchical regression is where a, is a multiple regression, but you are telling SPSS what order the variables are put into. And that will make more sense later when we do this um, in the software. So the formula for multiple regression is, let's go back to the formula, y equals a plus b1 x1, b2 x2, b3 x3, depending on how many predictors you have. So this will be like predictor 1 x1, predictor 2 x2, and they will all have a different parameter, which means there will be multiple slopes for each different predictor. And that's why it kind of looks like a 3D object rather than a single line. Don't worry about understanding all this too much. When we get into the data, it will make a lot more sense. The difference between multiple and hierarchical regression, in multiple regression, you just throw all your predictors in together. Not usually wise. In hierarchical regression, the researcher actually has uh, control over where the variables go. And I'll show you the best way, I believe, to do a hierarchical regression today and the best formula. Then we have logistic regression. Logistic regression is when we have a dichotomous dependent variable, which means split into two. So if we had the CESD, which is what we've been using, and it's on a continuum between infinity and negative infinity with zero in the middle, that's continuous DV. We can take the depression score though, and we can split it into two. And I'll show you that today. I'll show you how to dichotomize a variable in SPSS. Uh, the CESD 20 gives us a cutoff criterion score of 16. So if a participant scores 16 or over, they are considered to be experiencing depressive symptoms. 16 and under, they are not. So we will take that variable, break it into two, and then we can use that um, categorical variable with depression or no depression and create a logistic regression. So here's an example of a logistic re regression of the probability of passing your exam. So that's our dependent variable. How likely am I to uh, pass my exam? Dependent on how many hours I've studied. Now, as you can see down here, we've got our participants scores on whether or not they pass their exam. All these little guys down the bottom here did not, they got a zero, which was the category for not passing. And all these dots up here received a one, which means they passed. Now, can you see here, we talked about, did we talk about assumptions last week? I think we did. We talked about linearity and how important it is to have a linear straight line on a scatter plot. This is a very good example of a nonlinear relationship. So all of our dots create a curvy linear line and you cannot do a linear regression on a curvy linear line. So we apply logistic aggression. Now you can see here, there's a little bit of information in this graph about the relationship between passing and not passing, dependent on the hours of study. So these three participants did less than an hour of study and all three of these participants did not pass. But there are no participants who passed and only did an hour's or less worth of study. Then we've got one, two, three, four participants here who studied for less than two hours. They also did not pass. But up at the top here, we've got one participant who studied for less than two hours that did pass. Then when we have a look at three hours, we've got two participants who studied for three or less and two that who didn't pass and two that did pass. And then here down the back end, Anyone who did four or more hours of study tended to pass, whereas anyone who didn't pass did not do more than four or five hours. So there's a really good example of the relationship that you can access using logistic regression. And I actually think logistic regression is easier to understand than multiple regression um, in things that I've done. However, papers don't really like it when you lose, use logistic regression 
because they believe that if you've already got a continuous variable, you dichotomize it, you're losing key information that would be better in a linear regression. All right, any questions about the different types of regression before we move on? Yes, good. Feel free to put your um, microphone on if you like, Albie. Or type any, any way is fine. Yes, logistic regression is the same as binomial. It is called binomial logistic regression when there are two variables. And it's called multinomial when there is more than two. Binomial is the most common. This is a binomial regression here on the on logistic regression on the slide. Good question. Any other questions about our types of regression before we move on? So you need your DV as continuous? No. You need your DV to be continuous for all regressions except logistic. You can use categorical for logistic regression only. So see how this is categorical? Does not pass and does pass. Your dependent variable is dichotomous here. But our hours of study, that could also be classified as categorical, I reckon. Depends on how you ask that. If you asked how many hours did you study and some and they retyped one, two, three, four, five, or if you asked um, in boxes, one, two, three, four, five, it really depends on how you ask. So all could be categorical and logistic regression, yes. It, the depending um, variable is the dependent variable. In all regression, it must be continuous except for logistic. Good, yes. Excellent questions, thank you. Do not be afraid to ask. I have been studying regression since I started my degree nine years ago. And every year I write out the chapter on regression again and again and again and again because it's very, it can be tricky to, and you forget all the rules behind it. It's taking me like nine years to get to this level of understanding. So do not feel worried. If you are planning on doing a regression for your PhD or your master's or honours, it's probably a really good idea maybe to do a course in regression or to get a tutor if you don't feel completely 100%. Um, Andy Field's textbook, um, Discovering Statistics Using IBM. Come on, come on camera. Discovering Statistics Using IBM SPS Statistics is the best book for statistics if you want to teach yourself. Um, it's got a lot of dirty jokes in it though that you have to kind of get used to. I don't know why Andy Field writes like that, but he does. So the but um, it's really good for learning and there's step-by-step -step instructions on how I'm using SPSS in that book as well, which is amazing. Good, good, yeah, cool. All right. The most important part about any form of data analysis is making sure that your assumptions are met first. We talked about assumptions a little bit last week. Regression has the most assumptions out of all analyses. Some you do before you run the regression, some you do during uh, within the analysis itself. Sometimes you run your analysis and you get really excited about your findings and then you get to the end and you figure out that your assumptions aren't met and you have to run it again using a, uh, what's it called? I was gonna say box plot, that is not the right word. Bootstrap, similar. Um, so the regression assumptions, independence. Who remembers last week what the assumption of independence is? This will test you. One IV does not affect the other. Yeah, that's true. So the predictors and the, depend and the outcomes shouldn't affect each other. Easier to understand, if you're doing a survey, participants should not be uh, influencing each other's answers. Participants should never do the survey twice. 
otherwise that's not independent because two of the answers are from the same person. Um, in experimental research, uh, the experiments should really not be done at the same time so that the um, participants don't influence each other. So independence is always met before you do your analysis. Um, if you do your research design correctly. Uh, reasonable ratio of cases and predictors. Basically, that's just ensuring that your sample size is correct for how many predictors you want to uh, measure. That is usually done before you recruit as well using a uh, software called GPAL, which I'll show you in a second. Um, and GPAL will tell you what sample size you need to get power and also to make sure that you have a reasonable ratio of cases and predictors. So that's kind of done for you and must always be done before you start collecting data. Uh, normality of the dependent variable and the independent variable. So when we looked before at body weight and height, you would do histograms, QQ plots and Shapiro Wilkes to look at normality. I'll show you that as well. You'll make sure that there's no outliers using box plots. So no extreme cases impacting that mean that we talked about. Remember we talked about the mean is very sensitive to uh, outlying extreme scores. So you make sure that there's none of those in your data set. You make sure there's a linear relationship between the two variables using a scatter plot, which we looked at last week. So you make sure that all these are done before you run the analysis. And then in the analysis, SPSS will give you some uh, homoscedasticity of your residuals. So remember back here in the simple linear regression slide where I said these are the participants' actual scores on body weight and height. This line is if there if the model was perfect, each of those participants would fit on that line but because data is never perfect they do not actually fit on the line and their predicted weight is not what it would be predicted for their height so the difference between the star or the participant score and the actual line of best fit is the residual or the error so we're looking at normality linearity and homoscedasticity of the residuals between each participant's score and their predicted score in a perfect model. That is the whole framework of regression. It's all on the residuals because that's the error in the model. So you've got your perfect model. If all participants were perfectly body weight and height, and then you've got the actual outcome, the predicted versus the actual outcome, and that's whether or not your regression will be significant. So don't worry about normality, linearity, homoscedasticity of the residuals because SPSS does it for you. You just got to know where to find it, and I'll show you that. Independent errors, you want those residuals again, the error between the perfect model and the participant scores. You want those errors to be independent of each other. And SPSS will give you a Durbin Watson measure for that. It needs to be between one and three. Anything outside of those cause is a cause for concern. You need to bootstrap or you need to think of a different way of doing your um, data analysis. Oh, reasonable ratio of cases and predictors was on there twice because I thought it would be better up the front with independence. Okay, any questions about the assumptions before I show you? how to run a G power. I'm actually going to do it fresh right from the start. Oop. Okay. Here's G power. That's what it will look like when we're finished, but I'll show you how to do it. A lot of people don't tend to do G power because they don't understand how it works. It is, it looks kind of confusing. It's not. Um, just wait. It's okay. <laughs> I thought I did something wrong. Um, it's not that tricky as long as you know the formula. So I would write this down because I always forget this formula. Here we go. We've got a question. Is the exclusion of outliers prerequisite of regression or just best practice? Um, 
like I said, when we did the data cleaning workshop in week one, making decisions about outliers is something done in the group. If an outlier looks like a typo, definitely either change it to what you think it is or remove it. Or if the outlier you go through, and we might actually do this in a second when we have a look at some of the outliers in our data set, go through and make some decisions about whether or not you think that person is malingering. So go and have a look at their data and see if there's any anomalies or if their data doesn't make sense. If not, leave them in. Outliers in your data set will create like, create outliers in your residuals though. So then you make some decisions about that inside the regression model. But it's not okay just to remove outliers because they've impacted your um, analysis. And yeah, another thing that you can do is if you have quite a few outliers in your data set, run the regression first with the outliers in and then run the regression again taking out the outliers, making sure that you save that very first SPSS model before you take them out and see if there's a difference in the uh, outcome that you get. And then you can write in your paper, a sensitivity analysis was conducted with these outliers and it was found that they were not impacting the, uh, uh, the outcome. And so you would just leave them in. Louise. My data is recording a value of zero when no input, which messes up my mean, it's for land area, there is no zero or input in response. So that sounds like a, a typo, an incorrect um, value, and probably just needs to be removed and made into missing data. My data is recording a value of zero when no input, which messes up my mean. Yeah, so if you can see here on my data view, here in BMI, lots of people, yeah, so the dot in a data cell is actually a good thing because it doesn't tell SPSS that it's a zero. It tells SPSS that it's a missing value and it will not include that person in the analysis on that variable. So it's not messing up your data. It's just disincluding that participant for that particular analysis. That's a good question though. If you have actual zeros, you will need to go into the data set and find out why they're zeros because that's not missing data. That's an actual um, data point. So you'll need to find out why. Did that happen in your transformation from Qualtrics into SPSS? Or is it something that the participants put in themselves or, or the researcher accidentally put zeros in? You'll just have to go check it out and find out why. Lots of these fun things happen in analysis. All right, let's move on to GPower. So GPower is a tool that we use. It's completely free online. Um, just type in download GPower into Google um, and you will find it. It is a must do before you do any form of data collection. It tells you how many people that you need in your sample um, to get statistical power. Um, if you don't reach that power, then your analysis is uh, probably not gonna work. and um, your assumptions won't be met. So it's really, really important. So pretty simple. First, your test family. So you open up test family. Now t-test from last week, we realized is when you're comparing the averages between two groups. So if you were doing a t-test or ANOVA, they fall into the t-test uh, family as well. You would click on that, f-tests. F is the symbol for regression. So uh, we would choose F tests. All the ANOVAs are in F, interesting. And we would choose linear multiple regression, fixed modeled R squared increase. We want an a priori because we want to compute the required sample size before doing the data analysis. But this box here, you can also use to get post hoc power by putting sample size in and figuring out some things, you can do a sensitivity analysis in here as well. But we're just doing a priori, just trying to find out what sample size we need before we do our survey or before we do our experiment. The effect size we're looking at is usually 0.15 for a moderate effect size, 0.02 for a small effect or 0.35 for large. 
effect, we usually use moderate, so 15 is correct in there. Uh, your alpha, which is your p-value, is always 0.05. And then we want to use 0 0.80 for moderate power. We don't want to use 0.95. Now, this is where it gets a little bit tricky. Trying to, to decide what your number of tested predictors are and how many total. So in this data set that we're doing, we are looking at the relationship between diet quality and depressive symptoms. And then we've got a bunch of demographic variables and lifestyle factors that we want to con control for if they're significant. So our number of tested predictors is one, diet quality. And then as you will have seen from the correlations that we did last week, we had around six predictors that were covariates or confounding variables. So you would pop that in. Th these things you may not know before you do your data analysis. So it's wise to overestimate the number of predictors. I think all up we have, let me have a look, one, two, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. probably 11 all up. So we've got 10 unique predictors or confounding variables or covariates. So we would pop that in and that would tell us how many predictors we, how many participants we need, 55. If you wanted to increase your effect size to large, that's 0.35. You can calculate that again. We can put two in here if we want to include our DB. But the total sample size is coming up very small for some reason. Maybe because of our number of predictors because we've got so many of them. Cool. So that is how to do your G-Power and to get your number of participants. But always talking in collaboration with your supervisors about what effect size you are interested in and what power ratio. This one's done on 95 and the total sample size is 120. So the more power that you are looking for in your data set, the more participants you will need. Any questions about G-Power? Okay. Today, if we have time, we will also look at an analysis of variance, a simple ANOVA. And you will we'll see that regression actually has an ANOVA inside of it, which is a lot of fun. So we will move on to ANOVAs. And then if you would like, I can do more um, complicated ANOVAs next week, but we'll just be looking at a simple analysis of variance this week. The assumptions of ANOVA are normality, independence, homogeneity of variance, and group sample sizes should be close to equal. So they, you shouldn't have like 20 vegans and 120 vegetarians in your data set. Otherwise, you are going to violate that assumption. All right. Any questions before we move on to data analysis in SPSS? Excellent. If you feel after the uh, workshop today that you have any questions that you want to ask me that you didn't feel comfortable enough asking in the chat box, feel free to email me. I'm very happy to answer any um, and all questions that you have about regression. So last week we analyzed descriptive statistics, correlations and t-tests. This week we will expand on these analyses by looking at predictions of relationships and group differences with more than two groups. Um, as said before, we are working on a live data set. So this is a vegetarian for life data set that I started recruiting in March. It closed two weeks ago, so it's very new. It's very happening. Um, 
the research that I currently do on plant-based diet and depression usually shows that there is a uh, relationship between diet quality, so whether or not someone has high diet quality or a healthy lifestyle and low diet quality, eating lots of ultra-processed vegan and vegetarian foods, and their um, depressive symptoms. So most of the research that I have done has shown that there is that relationship. It is significant. And the higher your diet quality, the uh, less depressive symptoms that you have. Now, one of the interesting things for us in this research is that vegans and vegetarians, it's very hard to predict whether or not, how long they've been on the diet, how well they the compliance is with the diet. So we have a lot of people who identify as vegetarian who do actually eat um, meat on occasions um, and also attrition. So people will come off and on vegetarian and vegan diets um, and be omnivore for parts of time and then go back to plant-based. So this is stuff that's always happening in our research and we're not really sure because it's all cross-sectional that um, what is happening here. So we thought the best way to do that was to look at people who have been vegetarian for life since they were either born or since they were 18 and could make their own food choices. Uh, and to do this, we recruited mostly Indian or Australian Indian populations. Had one of the researchers in our team, Gurmeet, she is a Australian Indian and she has contact with a lot of people, especially on Facebook, who have been vegetarians for their whole life. So we can kind of look at if you've been vegetarian your whole life, are we going to find the same results as we did for these cross-sectional surveys on people who haven't always been vegetarian? This is not a mixed method study, although mixed methods is one of my favorite ways of doing studies. It's got no qualitative element to it. So we haven't asked any questions about how they feel about their diet or anything like that. So this is strictly quantitative um, survey data. And here is the data set. So those of you who have done the workshops have seen this. Um, we have our data set where we've asked demographic variables like gender, age. We took height and weight, which are down here now, and we used those to calculate the BMI because it's rude to ask BMI or people won't know. Um, we asked about geographical location, um, mostly Austra Australasia, India, and other Western countries like the United States, Canada, and the United Kingdom, um, education level, uh, whether or not they're vegan or vegetarian. We did ask them to self-report um, all the different categories of vegetarianism that there are, and then we created a variable that um, put them into vegan or vegetarian categories, and we have been using that as our grouping variable. Um, we asked them about sunlight exposure in the last week, and then we used some pre-validated scales for depression, dietary quality, so whether they had a higher or low quality diet, social connectedness, sleep quality, and the IPAC, which is the physical activity questionnaire. Now, the IPAC didn't work. People didn't put their data in correctly or just completely missed it because it was the last scale that we used. Um, so the IPAC we decided not to use because it's just useless. It would be interesting to know why they fluctuate from on-off vegan. That is a good question, Alice, and that is another study that we're currently looking at, um, focus groups with ve vegan and vegetarian men um, about their social identity and their motivations to be vegan and vegetarian and why this fluctuation and attrition does happen. So that is a good question, but leads, it lends to a real proper, pure, qualitative, um, rather than just asking them in the survey, having proper conversations. So that's a good, yeah. So that's our variable view. They're the variables of interest. This is our data view. Each participant's um, answers for those variables. What are we going to look at? Here's our research question. So it's very important to always have your research question nice and clear in your mind. Sticky tape it. Um, Post-it notes on your computer screen so you're always coming back to what the research question is and not deviating. 
particularly in analysis when you start finding fun things that have nothing to do with your actual original question. That's called harking or hypothesizing after. I don't know what the RFK stands for. It's hypothesizing or creating research questions after your analysis, which is very bad um, for statistical uh, reliability and replication. So our research questions are, does diet quality predict depressive symptoms after controlling for other demographic and lifestyle factors? So in the chat box, can you please put in what the dependent variable in that question is? Those of you who've done the workshops previously already know the answer to this question. Mm -hmm. We've got two different answers. Albie says depression. Massim says diet quality. So what's the what is the definition of a dependent variable? What's the word synonymous with dependent variable? Outcome. So what are we looking for the outcome in? Depression. Good. Depressive symptoms is our dependent variable. So it's our why. Which, which is our independent variable? Diet, good, diet quality, excellent. So then what are our co-varying or confounding variables? Variables that could influence the outcome that are not our independent variable. Demographics, yep, and lifestyle factors, good, excellent. Our second research question, so this is our regression question. If you ever see the word predict inside of a research question, that initially tells you that it's a regression always. So our second research question is, is there a difference in depressive symptoms between different plant-based diet groups? So what sort of analysis do you think would answer this research question? ANOVA, good, Albie, excellent, yeah. Good, what's the dependent variable in the ANOVA question? The dependent variable. Yeah, good. And what's the independent variable? Diet group, good. Now, this diet group is the diet groups that we originally asked, not the dichotomous group where we put all of the different dietary types into vegan and vegetarian because that would be a t-test, which we done last week. So this week we are going to actually look at, and a question did come up last week about flexitarians. So we looked at vegan and vegetarian when we split them and the flexitarians were in that vegetarian group, even though they do consume some forms of meat. So I was questioning whether or not the flexitarians should actually be in the data set or not, because they're just really omnivores who eat low a low consumption of meat. So today, we are going to have a look at the differences between the different plant groups that self-identified and whether or not the flexitarians may potentially be influencing the, the results. So that's a really good way of doing that. But first, last week, I promised that I would show you how to set your SPSS up so that you can so all of your output comes in perfect APA 7. So you don't have to do all the editing of the tables and the figures in APA 7. My PhD student actually taught me this. So here we go. You go to edit, options. 
And when you click on options, this uh, box comes up. You want to go to pivot tables. And yours won't say APA Times Roman, but you want to put it into APA Times Roman 12 point font, or you can do it in APA Sans Serif 10 point font, depending on which one. I just go with 12 point Times New Roman because that's what I always use in all of my um, papers. You can also make some choices here. You can display any variable that is less than 0 0.001 with an asterisk, which is usually really helpful in things like correlation matrix and things. And show footnotes and captions in tables. Usually they're SPSS footnotes and don't, aren't very useful. So I would not do that and I would apply that and click OK. Now your SPSS output will come in perfect APA 7. Let me know when you've all had a go at doing that, if you have SPSS open. If you don't have SPSS, uh, SCU does have a free download for the very expensive programs. So have a look in the software center or um, go to the library or the IT um, people and they will download it on your computer for you. It's one of the best perks of being um, a student at SCU. Throw your hand up or put a smiley face in the chat box when you're all finished and ready for me to move on. Yay. Oh. Really? It depends what um, degree are you doing? They should allow that. That's very strange. Honours, maybe that's why. You don't have the display 0 0.001 option. You might have a different version of SPSS and it might need updating. I have 28. Okay. Let's move on to regression. How about we have a break for five minutes up to 27 past? Um, and then we will move into the uh, rest of the analyses. Okay, I'll, I'll pause the recording. Cool. Okay. Okay, recording again. Perfect. So let's move into regression. Now, before we do any form of regression, the assumptions are really important. So remember there were a certain amount of assumptions we did before, and there were a certain amount of assumptions that happened inside the analysis. So I will step you through first the things that you need to uh, keep in mind when doing your assumptions checking prior to running your regression. So the first one, is the assumption of normality on the independent variable and the dependent variable. So what are our independent and dependent variables? What are the two variables we need to do these assumptions testing on? For our research questions, diet and... Depressive symptoms, good, excellent. Now, last week I showed you how to do descriptive statistics and you can look at normality on those using histograms and box plots, but there is also a way of running assumptions um, themselves inside of SPSS. So we will do that. We're going to look at a histogram, what's called a QQ and PP plot, which tells us a little bit about normality. We're going to look at box plots to check out our outliers and see if there's any extreme scores. And what's known as Shapiro-Wilk, which is also a measurement of normality on the two important variables. But remember, and we'll talk about this, if we have more than 30 participants, normality can be assumed using the central limit theorem. So sometimes some divergence on normality is okay. And we'll get to that in a second. So let's do that. So to run assumptions testing, you want to go to analyze, 
descriptive statistics and explore. And in explore, we want to put both Center for Epidemiological Studies for Depression Scale Total and the dietary screening tool, which is measuring diet quality into the dependent list, just like here. So descriptive statistics explore, and then you've got your two in here. Then you want to click on statistics. Now you can choose to get your descriptive statistics if you haven't already done your descriptives. It can be done in the assumptions testing. If you've already done them, you don't have to click on that. The important part is looking at our plots. So click off stem and leaf. Those are old school. I haven't used them in years. If ever, we want to look at a histogram to see if we've got that normal bell curve shape or if we've got a little bit of skew in our data. Um, and we want normality plots with tests, which will give us our Shapiro-Wilkes. Continue and OK. And the first time you run something, it takes forever. So we just wait for SPSS to kick into gear. Takes so long. Keeping in mind, do not feel like you are um, falling behind or you may not remember this. You can always go back to the recording later on, rewind, fast forward, pause when you're doing your data analysis and just follow along the steps that I've done. Now, as you can see, this is our output. And everything is in perfect APA 7. Yay. So you can just copy and paste it into your, um, into your manuscript if you want, which is amazing. Cool. So the first thing that comes up is a box that tells us how many participants we've got. Now, we should have no missing data for the CESD20 and the dietary screening tool because as we... Um, as we talked about in the workshop in week one, it was a decision made by the research team that only participants who had completed both the diet and depression questions were included in the data set. So we should not have any missing participants there. And we don't, we've got the 320 that we started with. Here's our descriptive. So our studies of depression scale, our CESD, and this is what we went through last week, has got an average score of 14.27. Now, um, this label here tells us that the scale ranges between zero and 60, higher scores equal greater depressive symptoms, and the cutoff for depressive symptoms is 16. So anyone over 16 had uh, depressive symptoms. So what does the average score tell us about the uh, depressive symptoms across the data set of, about, of our vegetarians for life? What does this 14.27 relate to? Yeah. This is probably one of the lowest scores I've ever seen on an average data set for depression, which is very interesting. So as a whole, the population is not experiencing depressive symptoms. However, there will be participants in here who, who are, and that's where it might become interesting to dichotomize the, the dependent variable into those who are and those who aren't depressed and run these regressions again. All right, so there's our standard deviation of about 10, which is quite high in comparison to the mean. So there's quite a large range of scores. So um, that's telling us a little bit of information. Diet quality, the mean value is 64.28 over here. Where'd that go? Yeah. Um, the label over here tells us that scores range between zero and 105 and that higher scores equals greater diet quality. Now that doesn't give us as much information as what this did because we don't know what 64.28 means in comparison to other data that have used this scale. So we'd have to go into the literature and have a look. Um, again, standard deviation of 12 is a lot smaller 
then a standard deviation of 10 to 14. So um, it shows that we have a bit of a tighter range of diet quality. So there's not as much range between the low and higher diet quality. These are all just descriptive things that we went through last week. So you would know all this before you ran your assumptions. What's really important about our assumptions testing is to test for normality, linearity, and out, look at our outliers. So you have a quick glance at the descriptives, make sure everything's looking fine. And then we have a look here. Now our Shapiro Will and our Kolmogorov Smirnov, always makes me think of vodka, are the p-value is less than 0 0.001. Is that significant or non-significant? Significant, right. Now that's not good when you're looking at assumptions because that means there is a significant violation of the assumption of normality for both the Kolmogorov and the Shapiro-Wilkes. So that's a concern to begin with. Then we look at our histograms. What is our histogram of depressive symptoms telling us about normality? Is that a normal, is that a normal curve? Skewed, yeah, that's right. Now what's interesting about this is that it's negatively skewed, which means that there are more people who are ex not experiencing. So if we had a look, experiencing depressive symptoms was at 16. So about here, this bar onwards is depressive symptoms. There are more people who aren't experiencing depressive symptoms. Now that's what we see in the general population. Only 12% of the general population are experiencing clinical depressive symptoms. So this is what you would expect to see. If we saw that the depressive the depressive symptoms were on a normal bell curve, that would be concerning because that means that a lot of participants would be here at about 20, which means they would be depressed. So it's very normal to see this skew in depressive symptoms. So just because it says normal, it doesn't mean that that's what you want to see in real life. So just the fact that that's negatively skewed does ruin our assumption of normality, just like what is being told here. However, why is that not a problem? Why might that not be a problem? Yeah, it's what we expect to see in real life, but why might this not be a problem for our data set, for our assumption of normality? Good, Zoe. Yeah, because we've collected more than um, 30 participants. So the assumption of normality can be assumed using the central limit theorem. So this doesn't matter for our analysis. This is a QQ plot. A QQ plot shows us the data and what a perfect line would be, just like our regression line. However, we really want to see these dots falling very close to this line. If there is a S shape like we see here, that suggests non-normality as well, but we know the central limit theorem comes into play. So we're just having a glance at this just to see what's going on. We know we were expecting to see this data, so it's not um, concerning. And that's why we always collect enough sample size. <laughs> Here's our box plot. Can anyone tell me from what we described about box plots last week, what this is telling us? No, SPS does not have a feature to ignore it because you still want to glance at it. If the skew was the other way and it was positively skewed, that would be mega concerning, but you do want to see that it's there. We don't want to ignore it if we have more than 30 participants because that's telling us something about the data that's very, very unusual to what we were expecting. So you just glance over it, knowing that that's what we were expecting from the data. Yeah. Good. So our QQ plots, we want them to lie on the line. If they're doing this, then that's a bit of skew. These ones you want about the same amount of dots under and above the line, which we don't see here. So the same thing, it's um, 
showing us that. Now with box plots, the main thing that we're interested in in this box plot of depressive symptoms is if there's any little circles or little stars, that's an outlier or a extreme score. On depression, we've got actually a pretty good data set with no outliers, which kind of corroborates what we found when we were looking at the descriptive statistics and the depressive score on average was under that clinical cutoff. So we've got a pretty healthy, uh, mentally healthy data set, which says something about our question to begin with, right? Because our question was, if you're a vegetarian for life, does that predict depressive symptoms? Well, our descriptive statistics are starting to tell us that might be the case. We just need to make sure that we run our inferential regression to tell us if that's a significant relationship or not. All right, let's look at diet quality. Does diet quality look normal? This is very interesting. What's that histogram telling you? Yeah, it's mostly normal, but there's like a couple of participants right down the bottom who have really poor diet quality over here that's making the histogram look really weird. So it might actually pay to go and find out who they are in our box plot and see whether or not that's real data or if it's just people who have just clicked all the same thing. Yeah, so there seems to be like all these people here who are looking like they're normally distributed on diet quality and then these couple down here have got really poor diet quality. It'd be interesting to find out what countries they're from actually. Our QQ plot's looking way more normal, just a little bit of a kick off at the top and at the bottom. So less skewed, so more of the dots are on the line. This is looking much better, about even above and below. But what's our box plot telling us about extreme scores or outliers? Alice is asking, so they're vegan, vegetarian, have a bad diet? Well, it looks like those couple might do. I'll be saying we've got two outliers here down the bottom. So we've got uh, participant number 175 and participant number 220 who look like they've got really poor diet quality. So let's go and have a look at that. So we go back into the data view and find participant 175 and participant 220. Too many carbohydrates. <laughs> carbs aren't bad for you. White refined carbs are bad for you. In excess, I truly believe if you want the donut, eat the donut. So 175, participant numbers 175 is a male. He's 60 years of age. He's got a BMI of 26. That's in the healthy range, I think. Just let me see. I actually did a BMI. I thought I did a BMI categorical. No, I didn't. 26 around, just over healthy maybe. What were our categories? I can't remember. I do BMI data all the time. I can never remember the categories. Twenty-five to twenty-nine, overweight but not obese. So they're a little bit overweight. They're from India. They're married. They have had up to a year twelve education level. That's interesting in itself because usually that is quite common. Anyone who hasn't had more education usually has lower diet quality. Um, considering what we found last week when we were doing our descriptives, that we have a very highly educated data set. This is very interesting to me. The person is vegetarian. They self-reported as just vegetarian and they have less than five minutes a day in the sun. So it's looking like some of their um, lifestyle factors are also showing that. Um, they've got a 12 on the CESD total, which is under that 16 cutoff. So not depressed when you categorize the CESD, but their diet quality is very poor. Let's go and have a look at their diet quality answers. Here they are. Okay. So for all the questions they've written, never, 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 never. 
Okay, so it looks like maybe this participant has just gone through the data set and just started clicking all the same ones. See these three or more, they're all the reverse coded ones. So it looks like they may have got bored. Yeah, all the questions are the same. So rarely, 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 rarely. Never, never, never. Okay, so this person looks like they have not done the, um, I'm going to write that down because I'm going to remove them from the actual data set. Remove 175. So it looks like they haven't done the, um, they haven't done it properly. They've just gone and clicked everything. So we would take them out and we would write that into the methods. Let's look at participant number 220. That person is male, he's 40, his BMI is 33.2, which is in that obese class one. They're from India, they're married, they only had a year 10 education level, vegetarian, self-identifying as vegetarian, less than five minutes. So even now, this is starting to sound very much like the other person, like they've just gone through and just clicked things. Their CESD total was 12. Was that the same as 175? Oh, it was. So again, this is looking like a participant who didn't um, do this properly. So let's go and have a look at their actual questions. Really, 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 really. Never, never. Oh, those ones are different. But it still looks like they've kind of just clicked. Mm, those ones are different. So we wouldn't take those ones out. Although it does sound dodgy, but it's not as bad as the other one. What was the term when a participant just gives inaccurate answers on purpose? It's called malingering. There's only two participants in the data set who look like they've done that, so that's okay. We would remove 175. Um, there's not enough evidence to remove 220, so we would just keep them in. Good. All right, what was I doing? Back to our output. That's right. Okay, so this is what could happen, and you can go and do, like, other things because you found something and, like, you have to redo it again, take out 175, redo your assumptions, make sure they're, they wouldn't change that much. We only have Mr. 220 in there. So that's your assumptions checking for normality and outliers. Linearity, we have to do on the IV and the DV before we do our data set because you cannot do a regression unless your relationship is linear and can fall on that straight line. So let's do that. Analyze. No, we'll go to graphs. Graphs. You can do it two ways. You can either go legacy dialogues and create a scatter plot, or you can go to chart builder and create a scatter plot. There's two different ways of doing it. Simple scatter. We put depression on the y-axis because it's the y variable. Get in there. And diet on the x-axis. Click OK. And this is our scatter plot of diet quality and depressive symptoms. To find out if you can put a straight line through it, double click, add line of best fit, close everything down, and there you have it. Can we put a straight line through our diet and depression scatter plot? Yay! Good, so linearity is assumed, so we can go ahead and do a linear regression. Okay, normality, linearity, and homoscedasticity of the residuals, independence of errors and multicode linearity happen uh, within the regression analysis. So we will do those as we move through the actual regression. So first I wanna show you a simple linear regression. Now we're going to do the simple linear regression on just the IV and the DV, diet and depression, and see what the relationship is between the two. 
Really, really simple. Now, the first thing that you always need to do before you do any regression is to run a correlation like we did last week to, in fact, make sure that depression and diet quality have a significant relationship. If the correlation is not significant, you cannot do a regression. And I'll show you a little bit more on that in a sec. But always making sure that we're running regressions on significant relationships. Do not put any variables into your regression that are not significant. So we did that last week, so I'm not going to put you through that again. But let's do a simple linear regression on diet quality and depression, which we found out last week was did have a significant relationship. So analyze regression linear, because we found out that it is linear. We want to put the dependent variable, which is depression, into the dependent variable box. And we want to put diet quality into the independent variable box. We can click on some statistics. Uh, Durbin Watson was one of our assumptions. Maybe some confidence intervals. All these will um, come into play when we do our multiple regression. We don't need these just yet. We probably don't need that either. Okay, so a simple linear regression looks like this. This is our output. The first box tells you what you entered into your model, which what what predictor variables you entered into your model. So you've got here that diet was um, included by itself and it was entered, forced into the model by itself. So the first box, the second box, sorry, will tell you how much of a percentage diet takes up of depression, which is one of the things that I most love about regression. Because correlations told us that there was a relationship, but it didn't tell us how much percentage diet quality takes up of depression. So in our model, R equals 0.269. That's our regression R. So that's the correlation. So it's 0.269. R squared is our variance, so our percentage, which is 0.07. So as a percentage, what percentage of depressive symptoms does diet take up in this? R squared is very low. How low? What is it What as a percentage? 7%. Good. So that is quite low, but that's in line with what we've seen in the data on all diet and um, depressive symptoms, to be honest, not even in plant-based diet. Across the general population, diet quality does have quite low variance. Good. Our Durban Watson is 0.695, though. So that's our assumption of independence of errors, and that should fall between one and three. So we've got a little bit of a problem with our Durban Watson there. So our independent errors assumption is violated. So that's interesting. The third box, our ANOVA box, tells us whether or not the model in total is significant. So we just skip and look here at our F ratio and whether it's significant. Our p-value is 0 0.001. Is that significant or not significant? Significant. Okay, good. So our model's significant. So there is a significant relationship between diet quality and depressive symptoms. If your ANOVA is not significant, you stop there, you don't move on and look at the rest of the data because a non-significant ANOVA means there is no relationship. There is no prediction. It doesn't predict the um, outcome. So you would stop there and not worry about looking at the rest. However, because we've got a significant ANOVA, we want to see what in the model is significant. Just diet quality is in there by itself. So it should be significant, which we found here. Our unstandardized beta here tells us as diet quality goes up by one unit, depressive symptoms goes down because it's negative by 
two, two units. Now that's okay in a simple linear regression because it's not being compared to other predictors. But when it is being compared to other predictors, it's better off to use the standardized beta, which is quite close. So the standardized beta means that as dietary screening tool or diet quality goes up by one standard deviation, depressive symptoms will go down by 0.269 standard deviations. And that is a significant change. Any questions? Can I explain the confidence intervals? Yeah, that's a good question. So confidence intervals tell you kind of a little bit more information than just that it's significant or not. So a confidence interval will tell you kind of like the range. So the T value that you got here, the 0.497, it tells you what likelihood or what range that that, um, I mean the beta, sorry. It will tell you what likelihood or range it could fall into. So anywhere between negative 0.13 and negative 0.31, this beta could fall into. If that's really wide, if your confidence interval is really wide, that means that it could fall anywhere. If it's quite narrow like this, that's pretty. That's a pretty good um, indication that this um, is a significant value. If your confidence interval crosses zero, so one of these is negative and one is positive, then it's likely that you do not have a significant um, relationship. But confidence intervals are quite tricky to understand, Sarah. So if you didn't understand that, um, go have a look at YouTube um, and type in ex explain confidence intervals. It took me about three years to understand how they work. So yeah, have a look at that. Good, so that's our simple linear regression. I'm going to close this down, this output, so I don't get confused when I run the next one. So that's the very foundations and the basics of running a regression. However, most of the time when we run regression, we're not really interested in just what the prediction of one variable is on another. Correlations will tell us that. It doesn't really give us any extra um, information. Usually when we run regressions, we are looking at hierarchical or multiple regressions where we put in the independent variable, the dependent variable, and we kind of control for all the other things in life that could be impacting depressive symptoms. And the reason that we use hierarchical rather than mul multiple by itself, where all of the variables are forced in, is because SPSS and the software programs tend to make decisions for you in a multiple regression and you force all the variables in and they'll remove ones they don't think are significant. So you want to be in control of your data analysis. So hierarchical is the best way to go and always enter your um, variables in yourself and don't force them in stepwise or anything like that. So we're going to have a look at that. <laughs> this is, I believe, yeah. I wondered why I put a correlation on the regression slide. So this is the correlations that we did last week. So this is a correlation matrix of all of the variables that we had in the data set, starting with the depressive symptoms variable. Now we are interested in only the variables that are significant with depressive symptoms to put in the model. So in that case, anything that's got an asterisk is significant. Anything without the asterisk is not. And we found this out last week that diet quality was significant, social connection, sleep quality. The DAS depression, of course, should be because if you're measuring clinical depression with depressive symptoms in the population, they should definitely be correlated. I'm actually surprised it's not higher than that. We've got anxiety. We've got stress. Age is not significant. BMI is not significant. Diet type was not significant. So whether you're a vegan or a vegetarian didn't change your depressive symptoms. Gender wasn't significant, but marital status, education level, geographical location and sunlight exposure were. So only the variables with an asterisk will go into our model. And we won't be putting the DAS in, the depression, anxiety and stress scale. It's not part of our research question. 
it's more of a fact check just to see um, if our CESD depression scores would match the clinical scores. So we use it as a bit of a fact check. But if you put a depression score and a depression score into a model together, it will completely invalidate your results. So please don't do anything that's that does that. And that brings me to multicollinearity. So we don't want any of our predictors to correlate too highly with any other predictors. So all these ones here in the correlation matrix, we don't want them to be around 0.8. So as you can see here, the DAS depression score and the DAS anxiety score correlate so highly with each other. And so does DAS depression and the DAS stress. Even, yeah, anxiety and stress, all of the DAS correlates really highly with itself. Even, yeah, that's interesting. So the rest of them are looking okay. The rest of them are looking okay. So there's not too much multicollinearity. And that means multiple predictors that, that have linear relationships that are too close to each other. That means you're measuring the same thing twice. You don't want to do that. So if you do get multicollinearity in your assumptions, you just remove one of those variables and you don't put it into the model. Just pretty simple. Okay, any questions about that and the assumptions before we move on to building the model inside the analysis? So building the hierarchical regression. No? Okay. So we will run the regression now, I think. Oh, yeah. Okay, cool. So all the significant variables from our correlations will go into the model. Now, this is the best way, I believe, to structure a hierarchical multiple regression. Step one, I always put in my significant demographic variables or my significant covariates that are demographic. In step two, I usually put in my other lifestyle factors or my other things that are affecting depression that aren't my IV or my demographics. And then in the third step, I will always put in my hypothesized predictor so that I can see what the unique relationship is between my outcome and my hypothesized predictor after controlling for all these other variables that are in step one and step two. But you can do it the other way around. You can put diet quality in first and then put your other variables in and see what happens that way. You can do that. I prefer this way. So that you always find that unique prediction of your um, hypothesis at, in that final model. But if you've been told to do it differently by your supervisors, that's completely okay. There is like, so many different ways of building these models. So let's go. Just let me see what they were first. Okay, marital status, education level and location were our demographics. Sunlight exposure, social connection and sleep quality were our lifestyle factors. So we go analyze, regression, linear, Reset, because we already did that simple linear regression. We want to do a hierarchical multiple regression now. So we put the CESD depression variable into the dependent box. We put the diet, no. In our first block, we put our demographics, which were marital status, education level, and geographical location. Then we click the next box to tell SPSS what we want in the second model. In the second model, we want social connection, sleep quality, and sunlight exposure. Making sure this method is always enter. Then we click next 
And in our final model, we want to put diet quality by itself. Then we go up into statistics. And this time we want to see our confidence intervals. You can also get your covariance matrix, which will show you that, um, again, the multicollinearity. If you don't do it the first time, you can do it within the analysis. Um, R squared change. So remember R squared was our um, percentage that the independent variable had in the dependent variable. We want to see how that changes between each model. We want our descriptives maybe. We want our part and partial correlations, which will tell us a little bit more information about the relationships. Our collinearity diagnostics, which is VIF and tolerance, which tell us about multicollinearity. That shouldn't be a problem because we already checked that in the correlation matrix. Durbin Watson is our independence of errors assumption and Case-wise diagnostics tells us if any of our residuals uh, have outliers that are, are too um, extreme. And maybe we should find one because we kept that participant in, we kept that 175 participant in that was malingering. Then in plots, we want to do a plot of the predicted value of y against the residuals on Y. So that's on the outcome of depression. We wanna have a look at histograms of the residuals, because remember, this is an important assumption inside the analysis. We want our normal probability plot and all partial plots, continue. Then we go to save and we can save our standardized residuals. So that's going to tell us if we've got outliers as well that are too extreme. You can look at Cooks and Mahalanobis. They're also um, measures of um, whether or not we've got too many outliers or, um, and you just use them all together to make your decisions. I think that's all. Yeah, I think that's it. And here's the bootstrap button. Now we all, we will use that bootstrap button if we ran this regression and we found a heap of our assumptions were not met, like normality was out, linearity was out, um, the homoscedasticity of the residuals was out. If all of our assumptions are violated, we would bootstrap our regression and that would um, provide a more unbiased result. But we're not gonna do that the first time around. And we're going to click OK. All right. How's everyone feeling before we get into the output? Any questions about putting all of the options into SPSS? No? OK. I will keep going then. I just don't want to rush off, um, keeping in mind you can um, watch the recording. Again, here's our descriptive statistics. We did see these in the simple linear regression. We wouldn't normally have done one before, but you would have seen these anyway when you did your descriptives. Just make sure they're all right. That's interesting. We've lost 50 participants. Hmm. We'll look into that later. That might actually be the reason why we're getting the result that we're getting. All right, that's okay. We should have 320 here. So SPSS has made a decision to remove 50 participants, probably because I did this case-wise instead of list-wise, and these are all impacting that. Okay, that's good. Okay. Note to self. Right. Again, this is a correlation matrix we just looked at, so we won't need to look at that. That will tell you whether or not the um, predictors are significant with the outcome and whether they're uh, too highly related to each other. We've already done all that, so we don't need to do that again. This is telling us, and always check this box, because if you make a mistake, this is where you'll find it. Um, tells us that in model one, we've included geographical location, education and marital status. That's right, that's what we wanted to include. 
In model two, we've got sunlight exposure, we've got social connectedness and sleep quality. So that's correct. And then in model three, we have put dietary screening tools, so the diet quality. So the model summary tells us how much of a percentage the model gives us in depressive symptoms. So model one, which includes all of our demographic variables, the R squared is 0. 0. 0.069. So how much of a percentage does uh, marital status, education level, and where you live take up in depressive symptoms in our data set? Seven percent. Good, Sarah. What about so that's our R squared, and that is significant. In model two, when we added sleep quality, sunlight exposure, and social connectedness, our R squared is 0 0.605. How much then are demographic variables and lifestyle factors? Um, as a percentage in depressive symptoms. Sixty-one percent. Good, Amy and Sarah. Now, an important um, measurement here is this R squared change. So it basically is just this R squared of model two minus this R squared of model one. So it is the unique um, percentage that lifestyle factors take up. So around 54% 54, 54 of depressive symptoms are taken up by sunlight exposure, sleep quality, and social connectedness, which is not what we were expecting to find. Now, what is our R squared percentage for when we add diet quality? 0 0.608, what is that as a percentage? 61%, good. And what's our R squared change as a percentage? Less than 1%. So our simple linear regression told us that there was about 7% of the variation in depressive symptoms taken up by diet quality. But now when we do our hierarchical regression, after adjusting for demographics and lifestyle factors, it seems that diet quality is only taking up about less than 1% of that variance now. And if you have a look at the significant change, it's not significant. So potentially adding those lifestyle factors has made diet quality not significant in our model. So something's happening with social connection, sleep quality and sunlight exposure with diet quality and depressive symptoms. So this is very interesting and not anything that we've seen before in our other data sets. So this is specific to people who have been vegetarian for life. That is not good for our hypothesis, Sarah, because it it is basically, ex we accept the null hypothesis. Now, our Durbin-Watson of independent errors is 1.43. It needs to be between one and three, so that's looking good now. So our Durbin-Watson wasn't good in our simple linear regression, so it might have something to do with the result. Now, our Anover box, remember, it tells us whether or not the model is significant. So who can tell me what's happening here? In our N over boxes. All three are significant, good. If model one and model two are significant, but not model three, we would read model two and we would ignore anything happening in model three. However, they're all significant, so we can move on to see what's happening inside the model. In this stage, because model three is significant, we would only interpret model three. But it does tell us that by themselves, demographic variables, by themselves, well, demographic variables and lifestyle factors together are significant. And then when we add diet quality and all the variables together, it's a significant model. So we will go down and we will only read model three because it's the one we will interpret.
just make sure I'm reading the right one. Yes. So the coefficients box tells us what in the model is significant. So let's go and see what is happening here. So remember our unstandardized beta is uh, how much for one unit increase in the predictor variable is a increase of this beta in depressive symptoms. Looking at all these different variables together, we want to look at the standardized coefficient and talk about things in standard deviations so we can compare. So we're really interested in these three columns here. So the standardized beta, the T, which tells us um, the strength of the relationship kind of in between depressive symptoms and the predictor and whether or not that relationship is significant. So let's go and have a look in model three at these three columns. So marital status, these three columns, I lost the columns, yes. So from here, marital status, as marital status goes up by one standard deviation, depressive symptoms goes down because it's a negative symbol by 0.04 standard deviations. So not really a lot. And that was kind of reflected in the uh, R squared at the top where we only had 7% of variance with our demographics and completely normal demographics shouldn't really impact depression that much. But just having a look here, as that's interesting, as education goes up, depressive symptoms go up. Interesting. And geographical location as well. So the T values are here, but what is our significance levels telling us about when we put our demographic variables into the model, all together with the other variables, what is happening here? What are these significant values? Are they greater than or less than 0.05? They're non-significant, right? So once we put all the demographic variables in with our lifestyle factors and diet quality, those demographic variables are no longer significant in the model. So that's that's good information for us and not that worrying because it wasn't really part of our hypothesis. So in seeing this, it might even be worth just removing the demographics and rerunning the regression with the um, the lifestyle and the independent variable because these are no longer uh, significant. What about social connection? Let's have a look. So this is where it's really interesting because social connection is usually the highest predictor when I've done this research before, but it's not anymore. So our standardized beta says that for every one standard deviation that social connectedness goes up, depressive symptoms go down by 0.3 standard deviations. And that is significant. Sleep quality, which is very interesting, it's actually the highest predictor in the model this time. Keeping in mind that sleep quality was as higher scores indicate greater sleep problems, so as sleep problems go up by one standard deviation, depressive symptoms go up by half a standard deviation. So that's pretty that's pretty significant. And that one has a significant p-value as well. Yeah, and we were talking about that last week. So Indian demographics, family structure, religiosity, all those types of things are playing a part in this um, in this data as well. So whether or not it's what we're looking at that's impacting depressive symptoms or it could have something to do with beliefs. But another thing to be um, to pay particular mind to as well is that on average, our participants aren't depressed or don't experience depressive symptoms. So our dependent variables, depressive symptoms, but most of our um, data set doesn't seem to have depression. So we might be better off dichotomizing the depression variable and doing a logistic regression 
potentially. Sunlight exposure, same thing. Um, where we're at, that's fine. What's happening with sunlight exposure? Is it greater than or less than 0.05? Greater than, so sunlight exposure is also non-significant. Good. So again, you might take that out as well. But our hypothesized predictor, dietary quality. The standardized beta shows that as diet quality goes up by one standard deviation, depression goes down by negative 0.05 standard deviations, which is not much. And it's what's going on with significance. not significant so our hypothesis is not significant don't worry Sarah it's the first time I've seen this actually which is really cool in itself so we don't get sad and we don't do a frowny face because we then think well what's happening here let's dichotomize those variables let's see what's happening um when we look at clinical versus those who are depressed versus those who aren't depressed it might actually just be because we have a very healthy a mentally healthy um, population that this is happening. So we'd go on and we'd do some more analyses. We'd split the data, have a look at that. We'd also, um, what else could we do? There's a, another thing that we would probably do. Can't remember. Anyway, so you don't really need the rest of this stuff. This is collinearity diagnostics. It tells you the same thing as doing that correlation matrix, whether the predictors are too highly correlated with each other. Um, this case-wise diagnostics and our standardized residuals, you basically don't want any of your residuals, your standardized residuals, which is this one here, to be greater than three. So our maximum standardized residual, even though we've got that extreme outlier in 175 and 220, our standardized residual, we don't have any kind of over three. So that's good. That means our outliers aren't really impacting the data set. So that's good. Um, yep. Here is our assumptions of our residuals. Now, remember I said earlier that your assumptions are all in your data analysis. They happen right at the bottom. So you can get really excited about what you've found in your analyses and then get to here and realize all your assumptions are out. So that can happen. <laughs> so don't get too excited. Um, our histogram for CESD is looking way more normal. So the residuals are nice and normal there. The PP plot is all the dots of the residuals are hugging nice and close to the line. So that's good. Our scatter plot shows that you can put a linear relationship between of, of the outcome with, and then it shows you with each of the predictors as well. So they all look like you can put a straight line through those dots, which is great. Now, that was very fast and very frantic. Oh, did you say we had our 320 back? Let me have a look. Where was that? There, hang on. Yeah. Interesting. I wonder why it's been removed. I'm going to go have a look at that after we've done. Um, there it is, uh, case number yeah. 320. Yeah, that's good. Okay. So this is all the steps that we have completed. Our assumptions are actually looking really good. So all of our assumptions were met. That's excellent. I know we're moving towards the finish of today. So I might do logistic regression next week and ANOVAs next week. Is there anything else you would like me to cover next week that we haven't done already? Or are there any questions that you have about the analysis today? I thought we would take up the whole time doing regression. That's all right. Well, I uh, it makes a good case for... Um... 
becoming Hindu? <laughs> yeah, they're no. <laughs> Aren't they? It's quite good. Um, I'm just being, I'm just having a joke there. But like that cross cultural perspective is very interesting. Yes. Yeah. And they weren't all Australian Indians or Indians. There was quite a few from other countries as well. Yeah. It was yeah, predominantly yeah. people. That's how we recruited. We were recruiting predominantly people who were faith based vegetarians. Ah, that's a good point. Will you talk next week about how to write our stats into words? Yeah, I will. How about I do a uh, APA 7 write up on the multiple regression that we just did? And then I'll do one for the anodes as well when we do them next week. So I'll write that down. Any other things people would like to see next week? Okay, so writing up, ways to write up. Yeah, yeah, that's good. APA 7 uh, reporting. That's a good point. No worries. Okay. Well, another excellent session. Thank you very much, Megan. Uh, so, yeah, we'll, we'll be seeing you again uh, next Wednesday, the 26th, for our final uh, workshop on statistics can be fun. <laughs> uh, is everyone having fun? That is the question. The feedback seems quite positive, so yeah. Oh, that's good. Excellent. Yeah. Well, oh, great. That's good. Some positive feedback there. No worries. Well, Abby's having fun. Look, it's fun subjective. subjective. <laughs> I always say that I really find statistics fun. But people are like, what? <laughs> <laughs> Different type of person. I really love the part where yeah. the numbers pop out and you like interpret it in the real world. And I think that's the difference between enjoying statistics and not, is that every time something comes up, you think in your mind, this is what this actually means to a real person. Yes. And instead of like just having all the numbers pop up and being like, oh, what is that? Being like, oh, okay. So this means that the data set, it has a lower depressive symptom on average than um, than the cutoff criterion and then bringing it, always bringing it back to real world interpretation makes it a lot more fun. That's right. This is real people, mm. their life, their life choices. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Well, that's yeah. right. Well, I think I'm off to have a vegetarian lunch today. <laughs> <laughs> well. How about everyone else? Out that it doesn't matter. Diet quality wasn't significant, remember? Oh, that's true. Go eat a donut for lunch. That's right, and get some sunlight. <laughs> oh, sunlight wasn't significant. It was social connection and sleep quality. That's right. Okay, thanks for recapping. <laughs> social connection, that's right. Yep, everyone go have a lunch. Have a nap, lunch. have a donut. Yeah. <laughs> donut, have a nap, go and ring your mum. Okay, uh, thanks so much, Megan. I'll stop there.